So, today I will uh, just talk about representations. So, one of the methods for anal studying representations is via modules. So, how do you do this? So, we will keep k just denotes some field and g is a group. Then if you have these two pieces of data, uh, you can talk about a representation. So, a representation of uh, the group is a pair rho comma v, where uh, v is a vector space over k. and rho is a homomorphism from G to the. So, this is a, the group of invertible linear maps from V to V. Okay, so, if this is a finite dimensional vector space, you could choose a basis and turn this into a group of invertible matrices with entries in K. So, this these two pieces of data uh, constitute a representation. Okay. So, the next thing we will do is try to translate this into the language of algebras and modules. So, we will use the notion of a k algebra. So, what is a k algebra? It is a ring whose underlying abelian group. So, whenever you have a ring, you have addition. So, you can talk about the underlying abelian group is a vector space over k. There is one more condition and that is So, if you have a ring, then there is also a multiplication map. So, you can think of this as a function from R cross R to R. So, you require that that map be k bilinear. So, this is what I mean by a k algebra and a k algebra homomorphism is a ring homomorphism. So, that means that it is a function from one k algebra to another which respects the ring structure. So, sums go to sums and products go to products, but we also require it to be k linear. So, this k linearity is the additional thing that we build into a ring to talk about the k algebra. And so, this also shows when we now define modules. So, when I say um, K, a module for a k algebra, I will mean a vector space over k. So, suppose R is a k algebra, then uh, an R module is a pair rho tilde comma v, where v as before is a vector space over k and this rho tilde is a k algebra homomorphism from R to the k algebra of Um, 
linear maps from V to V. So, these are the linear endomorphisms from the vector space V to itself. They clearly form a k algebra because you can scale a linear map by a scalar and you know this bilinearity condition is easy to verify. Okay. Okay. So, the idea is to study representations using uh, via modules of algebras as this notation suggests from a representation of the group G we will construct an module for a certain algebra and this idea goes back to Frobenius uh, probably uh, 1897 uh, there was a paper he wrote where he introduced the, the, the thing called the group algebra which is what makes this work. So, what we have is a group G and a field K. So, then you construct this, you put these two symbols together and you construct something called the group algebra. So, I will give you two definitions and depending on the context, it is uh, convenient to use one or the other and I will let you see that these are equivalent, it is not very difficult. So, definition one is that k g is the vector space with basis um, 1 g g in g. Okay, so, this all this which I said actually works when g is infinite also and I need to define it as an algebra. So, I need to define this bilinear map which is multiplication. Multiplication is defined by setting 1 g times 1 h. Now, these guys are elements of the group. So, you can multiply them and I say that this should be 1 g h. Now, a bilinear map is specified completely once it is specified on basis elements. So, this just defines multiplication on k g okay. and what is definition 2? So, k g is the space of functions f from g to k, which are 0 outside a finite set. Okay. So, I will say with finite support. And multiplication is defined by So, if I have two functions f 1 and f 2, their product is usually denoted by a star and this is uh, called convolution. You may have seen this in Fourier analysis. So, the Fourier transform converts products of functions into convolutions of their Fourier transforms. So, it is the same thing, but you have to be a little more careful because here we are in a non abelian group whereas, the real numbers form an abelian group. So, the best way to write it is like this. Since uh, these functions are finitely supported, um, this is going to be a finite sum for every g. So, So, this makes sense. Okay, so, we have a group from which we construct a group group algebra. So, how are this how does this allow us to study representation? So, given a representation of the group over k, we construct a k g module. So, how do you do that and that is you can easily guess what the formulation should be. So, 
So, this is just achieved by saying that rho tilde of 1 g should be rho of g. So, you have defined rho tilde on a basis therefore, so now you need to check that it is actually a module I leave that as uh, an exercise here. So, this is uh, an invertible L linear endomorphism of V therefore, it is a linear endomorphism of V there is nothing to check and modules will allow you to go back to representations. By the same formula, you define rho g to be rho tilde 1 g. Now, there is a slight worry rho tilde was not necessarily going to invertible things. So, why should this, if I set rho g to be rho tilde 1 g, why should it be invertible? Well, the point is 1 g times 1 g inverse is the unit of the ring. Um, so, I did not say it while defining a module, but we will also always assume that modules are unital in the sense that the, ident the ring has a unit and that unit maps to the identity endomorphism of the vector space V. So, that is an implicit assumption here. So, anyway, if, if you know what you are aiming for, all of this is clear. So, this sets up uh, bijective correspondence between um, representations of G and modules for K G. Okay, Let us go to an example. So, we will, I will define what is called the regular representation. We will work with the general now, uh, general notion of a k algebra. So, let r be a k algebra. So, for every r in r, define L tilde r from R to R to be um, given by x goes to R times x. So, this is just the product in the algebra. The algebra itself can be viewed as a module over itself. So, this is called the left regular R module. So, this is a pair, this is the vector space and this is you have to check of course, that so this is the k algebra uh, r goes to L tilde r is a k algebra homomorphism. So, this is called the left regular representation of r. Uh, well, I guess I should say r module. And what is the representation theory analog of this? So, that is what we will call the regular representation or left regular representation. So, if R is actually the group algebra K G. Then, by that correspondence between representations and modules, you can use this uh, module to get a representation. So, which I will call L, K G, and this is called the left regular representation of G. So, what is it given? It is just, so this should be L tilde 1 G 
of 1 x which is 1 g times 1 x. So, this is 1 g x. Okay, if you are new to this kind of stuff, a good exercise to do is the following. So, we had two definitions for the regular um, for the group ring. One is as a vector space with basis uh, 1 x x in g, but the other was as functions. So, what does this translate into as functions? So, the question I am asking you is suppose I take a function f and I apply L g to this, then what is its value at x? Any guesses? Yeah, so it is not you would think it is something like g x and it is not f of g x, but it is something like that it is f of g inverse x. So, you need to work this out it I think it is a uh, well, it is it is not a very deep thing, but it is important to just get familiarity with these things. You can also define the right regular representation. So, that is just defined by um, so when you do this somehow an inverse has to come and you will see why this inverse comes if you check that this is a representation. Okay, we would not be looking at this much for now, so I will just leave it at that. Okay, so, these are the basic definitions and an example. Now, let us get to the study of the modules. So, the approach is to try to understand all modules by understanding their building blocks and uh, in some sense the building blocks are the simple modules. So, let me just explain what all this means. So, firstly we need the notion of an invariant subspace. So, So, W is an invariant subspace of a representation. So, a representation is uh, rho comma V. So, you can often just write that by right F rho G W is contained in W. Actually, it will turn out to be yeah, is is contained in W for every G in G. So, the space is just preserved by every element of the group when it acts via the representation row. So, for example, So, for example, um, we have here one precious example of uh, representation, the regular representation. So, if you believe what I said that this is, um, well, I will just give it away f of g inverse x, then it follows immediately that constant functions. form an invariant subspace of the regular left regular representation L k g. Because if you this is just a translation of the variable. So, if you start with a constant function and you do some substitution of the variable 
it is going to remain a constant function. You can make the same definition for a module. So, W is an invariant subspace of a module rho tilde from R to end k v, if rho tilde g w is contained in w for every g in R, maybe you should say R in R and you can take L tilde k g for example, the constant functions. So, I would not repeat all these definitions in both cases, it is usually clear if I define something for representations, what should be the definition for modules. Okay. So, here is the next definition and see if that makes sense for modules as well. So, simple representation or simple module. So, a representation or module is simple if it contains no non trivial proper subspaces okay of course the zero the the zero dimensional subspace consisting just of zero is invariant and so is the full module or representation, but between, besides that there is nothing else. So, have we seen an example of a simple module yet? So, uh, what about constant functions, is that simple? So, it is one dimensional right. So, what can its subspaces be? They must have some dimension. So, they are either 0 dimensional or 1 dimensional. So, they are either the full thing or 0. So, this is a simple representation. Any one dimensional representation is simple. Okay, the next thing we need to talk is about how to relate two different modules or representations and these are done via intertwiners. So, now suppose I have two representations rho 1 v 1 and rho 2 v 2. So, I have two representations. Then, um, of the same group G, then a linear map T from V 1 to V 2 is called an intertwiner if um, it takes the action of G on V 1 to the action of G on V 2, which means that T of rho 1 G times V is rho 2 G T of V or in other words you can say that T circle rho 1 g is equal to rho 2 g composed with T for every g in g. You can do the same thing for R modules, then they are usually called R module homomorphisms, but in representation theory we often use the term intertwiner. You can also call them morphisms of representations. So, if you were trying to construct a category of representations, then these would be the morphisms. 
Okay, so that is the basic definitions we need and now we will come to the first non-trivial result of this course which is Schur's lemma. So, I will break it up into two parts. Let me first give you the first part which I will call Schur's lemma 1. Okay. So, some notation I will use the notation HOM subscript G V 1 V 2 to denote the space of intertwiners from V 1 to V 2. Okay, and if I put HOM k v 1 v 2, I would just mean the linear maps from v 1 to v 2. So, so, this is just a k vector space. So, let us assume that k is algebraically closed for now. V is finite dimensional. Simple representation of G. Then every intertwiner, let us say self intertwiner. So, it intertwines V with itself. Oops, oh, sorry, T V to V. So, this means that T commutes with rho G for every G in G, if you just recall the definition of an intertwiner. Is a scalar multiple of the identity map. which I will usually denote by id subscript v. Okay. So, this is a fundamental and fairly easy theorem. So, the point about algebraically closed is that then every linear endomorphism has an eigenvector. Okay, it has an eigenvalue because it is algebraically closed and therefore, an eigenvector. So, um, you could actually look at the eigen space for this okay, and this would this will end up being an invariant subspace. So, since k is algebraically closed, T has an eigenvector. Now, you look at the subspace V lambda, which consists of V in V such that T V equals lambda V. This has got to be non-zero. That is what it means for lambda to be an eigenvalue. But you can check that this is invariant because T is an intertwiner. Okay, so, this turns out to be an invariant subspace. And since it is non-empty, it must be all of V. which means that T v is equal to lambda v for every v in v, which means that T is lambda times identity. So, it is that simple the proof. So, something very similar holds if even if the 
field is not algebraically closed. Let you think about that on the assignment. So, there you cannot get an eigenvalue, so it would not be a scalar. So, we will not distinguish between um, two representations which have an iso uh, an intertwiner which is also an iso isomorphism of vector spaces a bijective intertwiner. So, these are called isomorphisms. So, um, an isomorphism is just a bijective intertwiner. So, suppose you have a bijective intertwiner T from V 1 to V 2, since it is a bijection you can talk about its image, uh, its inverse and its inverse will also be an intertwiner. So, uh, so what you see is that um, two we will say that two representations are isomorphic if there is an isomorphism from one to the other and it is easy to check that this is an equivalence relation on representations. So, so um, we will say that V 1 is isomorphic to V 2. So, here I have dropped the row 1 and row 2 though in this statement that is implicit because I will be assuming that T is an intertwiner and to define an intertwiner row 1 and row 2 matter, but this kind of abuse of notation is going to be quite common in this course. if there exists a linear, let us say a bijective So, T is called an isomorphism and its inverse will also be an isomorphism. Now, we can state the second part of Schur's lemma. If V 1 and V 2 are simple, then there are two possibilities, either they are isomorphic or there are no non-zero intertwiners between them. But I will state it in a slightly, yeah. So, the equivalent statement is that every non-zero intertwiner is an isomorphism. Consequently, either V 1 is isomorphic to V 2 or home V 1 V 2, I should put a G here. So, only these two extreme cases are possible for simple representations. And the Proof is again not very difficult. So, 
so um So you just use the fact that they are simple to show that any non-zero intertwiner must be bijective because if it is not surjective, then its image would be a non-zero subspace of V2, but it would be an invariant subspace. So, well, okay. So if it's non-zero, then its image would be an invariant subspace of V2. It would have to be all of V2 because it would be a non-trivial subspace. So it would be surjective, and similarly, you can show that its kernel must be trivial. So, so corollary is this is that um, this is another way of stating Schur's lemma that um, if k is algebraically closed, v1 and v2 are simple. And t v1 to v2 is a um, non-zero intertwiner then every intertwiner from v1 to v2 will be a scalar multiple of t So, if you can catch hold of one non-zero intertwiner between simple modules, you have got them all. And the proof is very simple, uh, you just take T inverse, now that is uh, that's an that's a intertwiner from V2 to V1, now if S is an intertwiner from V1 to V2, then T inverse circle S is an endomorphism of V1. So, by the uh, by Schur's lemma 1, uh, T inverse circle S is equal to lambda times identity of V 1, which means that S is lambda times T. Okay, so, Okay, now we will come to the next uh, non-trivial theorem, which is called Mashka's theorem. So, here we will put some restrictions on what k and g can be. So, um, if rho comma v is a representation of g, and now the hypothesis is that the characteristic of k does not divide the order of the group g, then every invariant subspace of v admits an invariant complement. So, this uh, hypothesis is uh, necessary. In fact, 
the converse of this theorem is also true as you will see on the homework that if for every representation of G, every, uh, every invariant subspace admits an invariant complement, then the characteristic of K does not divide G. In other words, um, if the characteristic of K does divide G, then it is always possible to construct a representation and an invariant subspace of that representation, which does not have a complement. Okay, for now, let me just give you a simple example. Take a field, any field with a characteristic 2 and look at the re regular representation of z mod 2. So, you can calculate that the only invariant represent subspace of this consists of constant functions and uh, so it cannot have an invariant complement because that is the only invariant, proper invariant subspace. So, that is uh, one example, but you will study this in somewhat more depth if you solve the homework problems. So, before I give a proof of uh, Marshall's theorem, let me explain to you what I would call the uh, projection yoga. So, So, um, a projection operator is just a linear map which is equal to its own square. Okay, so, P in end k v is called a projection if P is equal to that is it. So, let me give you an example of how to construct projections. Suppose, I have a vector space V and I can write it as a sum of two subspaces. So, suppose I write V as W direct sum U. Then, for every vector V in V, I have a unique decomposition. So, w in w and u in u such that v is w plus u. This is more or less the definition of direct sum. So, I will define p w v to be w and p u v to be u. Then these are projection operations. because if something is already in w, then when you break it up, it remains itself because w plus 0 is a decomposition. So, it is the only decomposition. So, so these things with this p v will end up in w and then it will not be moved again. So, p squared is equal to p, uh, p w squared is equal to p and p u squared is equal to p u. A word of caution here, uh, the notation is quite misleading. P w actually depends on both w and u. If I change u, then P w will also change, because this decomposition will change completely. Um, in geometry, we often study orthogonal projections. Since we are working over a pretty arbitrary field, we do not have that kind of structure for us here, which is why things my proof is going to be a little more complicated than what you will find in some other books. Okay, so, so, given a decomposition you can construct two projection operators. I want to say that basically this is what all projection operators amount to. If I have a projection operator, I can construct from it a decomposition, so that it is one of these two. So, I want to do this construction backwards. So, 
So, let us start with the projection P. So, that just means P is a projection. Then I can look at identity V minus P. So, let us square this. This is identity V minus 2 P plus P squared, but P squared is equal to P. So, this is identity V minus 2 P plus P, which is identity V minus P. So, if I have a projection, then it is different from the identity is also a projection. These two projections P W and P U satisfy that kind of relationship. P U is identity of V minus P W and P W is identity of V minus P U. That is clear from this equation. So, so let us set W equal to P V and U equals identity minus P. So, these are the images of P and identity minus P. Just as here the image of P W is W and the image of P U is U. Then I want to claim that V is W direct sum U. Of course, um, any vector V is P V plus identity V minus P V, right? P V plus V minus P V. So, that is just V. So, that means that um, v is every vector can be written as a sum of something in w and something in u. So, v is w plus u. What we need to show is that w intersect u is 0. So, if x is in w, then well okay, let us just call it w is in w, then uh, that means just means that w is p of v for some v in v, that is the definition of w. So, this means that if I calculate P of W, well that is P squared of V, but P squared is P, so that is P of V, so that is W. So, just using the fact that uh, P is a projection, I have proved that uh, for any element in its range, it acts by the identity. Similarly, identity minus P of u is u for all u in u. The same thing because this is also a um, projection. Now, if something is in both u and w, then we will have that. So, if x is in w intersect u, then both these things will happen. So, I will have P x is equal to x and x minus P x is equal to x, right. But so if P x is equal to x, if I substitute that into the second equation, I get x is x minus x. So, which means that x is 0. So, the intersection can only contain the 0 vector and nothing else. So, this is what I would call the projection uh, uh, yoga. It is just uh, something you may have seen in your linear algebra course already. We will use this to prove Marshka's theorem. We are looking for an invariant complement, but this just tells us about complements as such. 
So, it tells us that um, complements can be read off from projection operators. So, for invariant complements we need a slight uh, this thing, a slight modification of the projection yoga and that is the following. So, suppose I have a decomposition and now let us think of V as a space on which I have a representation of G, okay. then um, and W is invariant. So, so in the setting of Marshke's theorem, so uh, we have W is invariant, this V is a part of rho V. Then I can talk about P W and P U. Okay. So, then P W, even if W is invariant, P W need not be an intertwiner, but P W is an intertwiner if and only if U is also invariant. if and only if u is invariant. Okay, let me explain the setting again. I have a representation. I have an invariant subspace w. So, then I write down using and I take a complement u, any complement. Then using that complement, I can write down this projection operator p w as I just explained. And the statement is that P w is an intertwiner if and only if the complement is also invariant. Okay, the first space is assumed to be invariant. The projection depends on both the spaces as I had said earlier. So, the way we will prove Marshke's theorem is we will start out with um, an arbitrary complement and then we will get a projection operator from that. Then we will somehow average the projection operator out against the um, group over the group and then we will get an invariant projection operator and it is that will be used to give the invariant complement. So, let me just give you the proof of this uh, lemma. So, So, I will just uh, prove that if P w is an intertwiner, then, then u is invariant. I okay. will leave the con uh, other part to you. So, um, so let us see, rho g P w of w. Well, so if W is in W, then P W W is just um, W itself. So then this becomes rho G W, which now since W is invariant, this is equal to P W rho G W. So this is true for all W and W. So, at least when you feed in something from W, P W is always an intertwiner. Okay, what if you feed in something from U? So, um, P W X U, uh, P W U is equal to 0. If I take any uh, u in u, then p w u is equal to 0. right? So, what happens is that rho g p w u is equal to 0. 
Now, I want rho g p w to be p w rho g. So, I want p w rho g u to also be 0. So, so p w is an intertwining operator and g v if and only if rho g u is equal to 0 for every u, right? Because I want rho g p w u to be p w rho g u, but rho g p w is 0. So, I want um, belongs to you, sorry. Those are the things on which it is 0. Thanks. Right, because I checked it on W and I check, I, it will hold on you if and only if this condition holds. So, right, P of something is 0 if and only if it is in U. So, um, but this just means that u is an invariant subspace, clear? Okay, now we will complete the proof of Marshkas theorem. So, as I said, we will start with an arbitrary complement, then we will construct the projection operator, then we will average out the projection operator and then we will see that we have constructed an invariant complement. And this is where this hypothesis that the characteristic of k does not divide the order of g comes into play. So, if the characteristic is 0, there is no problem, g can be any finite group and if the characteristic of um, k is a prime p, then you require that that prime p does not divide the order of the finite group g. Okay. So, what is this averaging argument? Define P w. So, bar stands for averaged out. So, the cardinality of g, you think of it as 1 added to itself that many times, it is a non-zero number because the characteristic of k does not divide the order of g. And by averaging, I just mean you do this. So, firstly, I claim that this P w bar is actually an intertwiner. So, that is easy to check, I will just leave it to you as an exercise. Okay, somehow you will. I, you will average out whatever discrepancy there is from it being an intertwiner becomes 0. And the second thing to check is that P w is a projection, P w bar is a projection. Then once I have this, I can define uh, I can take identity minus p w bar and look at its image that will give me an invariant complement by that lemma which I had earlier. So, p w bar of w is 1 over cardinality of g rho g p w bar rho g, oh sorry this is p w g. Now, this w is invariant under is an invariant subspace. So, this is still in w, right, but we saw that this projection operator acts as the identity on w. So, this is just equal to rho g w. 
So, I get oh sorry there is an inverse somewhere right, rho g inverse w is also in w. So, so, so this is uh, rho g rho g inverse w, so this is just um, w. So, at for w and w uh, p w bar is actually w, so p w bar is uh, square is equal to p w on w and it acts as the identity on w. So, w is contained in the image of p w bar and of course, w is equal to the image of p w bar because this is uh, I mean this is in w if I um, yeah. No, hang on. So, we have not come to that yet. So, this much is clear, right? So, let us check it for general x in V now. Then um, oh yeah, this is correct. What I was saying, Pw bar x is in W. So why is that? So um, whatever this rho g inverse x is, Pw will bring it into W, and then W is invariant under rho g, so it will remain in W. So I'm averaging a bunch of things in W, so it will remain in W. So in fact, what I said was correct the image of p w bar is actually equal to w and um, okay. So, p w bar squared x is equal to p w bar p w bar x, but we showed this is in w, but and for everything in w p w bar acts as identity. So, that is p w bar. So, p w bar is actually a projection operator. So, I think that completes the proof, right. So, just to complete the let me just make the right noises. Um, so, uh, define u bar to be identity of v minus p w bar the image of this Then by that lemma, u bar is an invariant complement. Okay, if you are working over the real numbers or complex numbers, um, if you have a finite group, you can simplify this thing quite a bit. Um, the point is that if you have a, f a finite group, then uh, you can find um, um, an inner product on your vector space. In the real case, uh, just a sort of a real inner product and in the complex is an emission inner product, which is invariant under the group action. So, in that sense your uh, group is acting by unitary or orthogonal elements and you know that um, um, if you have an invariant subspace for a unitary element, its orthogonal complement is also unitary. So, you could do something much simpler for real or complex representations. So, this, this proof is I like it because it does not bring in anything extraneous, we are just talking completely algebraically. And uh, the main point about this is that it gives what is called complete reducibility. Every 
reduce it. Every finite dimensional representation in this context, so if you have a group uh, who, if you have a field whose characteristic does not divide the order of a group, then every finite dimensional representation over that k is a sum of simple invariant subspaces. So, in some sense uh, every representation is built up of its simple pieces. Okay, if you did not have invariant complements, the situation would be much more complicated. Uh, you could know all the invariant subspaces, but you would still not be able to tell what the representation um, is. So, every finite dimensional representation is a sum of simples if characteristic of k does not diverge. So, let me just end this lecture by introducing you to some jargon. So, suppose I have um, k algebra R, then I say that R is semi simple if complete reducibility holds. That means, every finite dimensional R module is a sum of simple modules. simple in so what we are saying is that to paraphrase kg is a semi simple algebra if characteristic of k does not divide the cardinality of G. In fact, this is an if and only if statement. What we have proved is this implies this, but it is actually easier to prove that this implies this by constructing counter examples. So, I do not know why everyone is quiet whether it is the video camera or you feel that it will be recorded or something. No, it is not it's just a very, it's just so we are just trying out something. So, you can.